Bitcoin is not a hedge that I put out earlier this year, but that is the core of it. And at each time the thing breaks, they have to put more dollars that they, that they had put in before, but also the system needs to be growing. The credit system in order for it to not collapse needs to be growing. And as the credit system becomes larger, that's actually, it necessitates more nominal credit be created for it to grow um, because a certain amount of liabilities are rolling off each year, right? So um, so what, what functionally happens is they have to print more money each time as the system becomes more and more fragile. That induces more and more credit creation, which then as they try to, you know, reverse out the consequences of it as it, as it you know, kind of manifests itself in inflation and volatility, then each next time, it's like it's impo- the timing is impossible to predict. But, but I think what is foundational or fundamental about it is that the problem only gets worse. Yeah, the outcome is very predictable. It's just when it will happen, nobody knows. Yeah. But again, another important point to really dig into well, here. Well, and also, but on that point that you're making about the timing accelerating, it's like if you look at what they did was post financial crisis. They waited until 2017, so they introduced cash from 2008 to 2014. Then they started raising interest rates in 2015, but they didn't change the balance sheet until 2017. So from the last dollar that they put into the system to when they started to withdraw, it was three years approximately. And then they withdrew 700 to 800 billion over a a 24 month period. Well, they put five trillion in the system over a two-year period versus three point six trillion over a five-year period. From two thousand, the three point six trillion was two thousand into two thousand eight to two thousand fourteen. So, like, they're accelerating the they they put more money in the system five trillion from September of twenty nineteen to September of twenty twenty one, and then that had set off this. I mean, it, realistically, it was a cumulative buildup of all the money that they've printed over decades, but It gets exacerbated and they start to signal in the fall of 2021 that they're going to raise interest rates, which they start in March, but they didn't start withdrawing the liquidity from the system until the summer of last year, 2022. Well, they took out a trillion dollars in less than a year, right? So they put money in faster. They took money out faster. What does that do? Accelerates the timeline of the, of, of whatever financial crisis was going to happen. Yeah. And I don't, and the point I was going to make, too, is like another th- important thing to lean into, which you touched on, but we didn't articulate it this way, is that every time they add more cash, they have to get unique in the ways that they add cash. In 2008, we'll buy your mortgage back securities. 2020, we'll buy your corporate bonds, your muni bonds. Who knows what's going to happen now? But not only are you, are you introducing more cash into the system, but you're expanding the landscape for potential moral hazard, right? Because the the announcement they made last night with the FDIC, the Treasury, and the Fed saying, essentially said, we're going to backstop <laughs> all your deposits. Like, there, there's no scenario in which depositors are not going to be able to get their cash. And that introduces moral hazard to the banking sector. We're like, oh, they're going to they're gonna backstop all of our deposits. Like, we can go take any bet we want. Well, I think that... Um yeah, I think in maybe we talk about kind of moral hazard, like the whole system, the system is built on moral hazard. So it's difficult to say that the incremental moral hazard that they have introduced materially changes the um, the broken incentives that, that already existed. They, uh, they certainly do, but to like fo- that's like focusing on the, the edge rather than the core. Um, I think... One of the things that, um, you know, Bill Ackman, uh, Jason Kalkanis, David Sachs have been out there hammering for a, a Silicon Valley bank bailout. Um, now, the shareholders weren't bailed out, but the depositors were, and the, the depositors have more value than the than the shareholders did, and the same for Signature, whoever it might be. And they said, like, now's not the time. I think I saw something from uh, Larry Summers, too. That guy's a clown. Um <laughs> But, um, so but saying like now's not the time to be lecturing us about moral hazard. It's like realistically, now's always the time. But they're also right in the sense that like 
the system from its from its most rotting core um, got to where it is because of moral hazard. The moral, the ultimate moral hazard is the Fed has the ability to print money, and so we can kind of focus or get distracted on, you know, kind of the the occurrence of the day, but. The moral hazard was when the financial crisis happened, they they always had the ability to print money, and they did it in a wide scale way, larger, faster than they ever had before. But it was functionally the same, and and what they did though from a um, from a legal perspective, they they I think they codified too big to fail, like they they said these banks are systemically important banks. They are too big to fail, like. And, and, and when these guys are out there, it's like they're both wrong from like they were they were wrong in the sense that they were only, like these guys, they're only looking out for themselves. They don't give a shit about America, about Main Street, about jobs. They were worried about their money interests. Right. Let's just be absolutely clear about that. Um, but they also weren't necessarily wrong in the sense of like this is a this is a real problem. But. And and I think one of them said like if, you, if they were or maybe they were all saying this and this was this was the the broken um, thing about it was if you do not bail out Silicon Valley Bank depositors then then there's going to be a bank run everywhere. Well, even today there was a Silicon Valley bailout, and the logical thing to do is to like still is to move your reserves to a too big to fail bank, like because. What they didn't do was guarantee all deposits for all institutions. So if you're sitting there at institution, you know, three through a thousand, they have not guaranteed anything. And and if you're in a scenario where your your bank has been taken over by the FDIC and you're waiting to learn whether or not what they're going to do with that next one, you still have the incentive to move your deposits to – JP Morgan to Wells Fargo to City. Like they codified that in 2000 in the in the period after the financial crisis. They they basically said, "Hey, we've got this moral hazard of um too big to fail banks, which everyone knows that we're going to bail out. Um oh, wouldn't this be a great idea? Let's let's make this law that these banks are too big to fail. What do you think is going to happen, you know? Like um and so when they bail out, you know, the ninety three percent of deposits that were there, it's like I don't really care. The whole, the system's broken, you know. Like it just hopefully wakes some additional people up to the fact that it's broken and that we accelerate over to Bitcoin. But the moral hazard, basically, the moral hazard was always there. It was the Fed can print money. They can they can choose who and when they bail people out. Um, humans are fallible. They always will. Um, in terms of like you know, not uh, they will always bail people out. They will not always use that power um ratably um or in an unbiased way um and you know like there's a reason why signature banks out of business today and first republic still open no maybe first republic isn't open by the end of the day doesn't seem like um, we're over 24 now bitcoin's ripping holy shit yeah like but that but that's the other thing that comes back to it which is um people you cannot figure bitcoin out if you have no knowledge of it but there are people that have been aware of it that were on the periphery that weren't yet there. And then they see this and they realize, holy shit, I can't trust anybody. Or they realize, holy shit, this whole thing is based on trust. Right? So imagine th four days ago, you didn't know what Bitcoin was. You knew it was out there, but you hadn't like, you hadn't, started to think about it well when all the banks fail you can't just magically understand bitcoin but there's a large swath of people that next wave of adopters that were looking at it and saying like this doesn't make sense but maybe you know like you know i'm not going to totally dismiss it and they've got 10 million dollars in their bank account and then this shit happens and they're like holy shit 